you know, and it's just, it has been such a fun ride. I have loved murder pits, which are kind of what you'd expect. They're these deep, deep holes in the ground. And there were spikes inside those holes. Uh, I think a lot of trombone players will roll their eyes and go, of course. Today on the Uniweb Interview Show, I am joined by Laura Basica author of Bluebells Chronicles. Laura, thank you so much for coming on the show today. How Thanks are you? Me. I'm good. I, awesome. I dragged myself out of bed for this. <laughs> you, you said you dragged, right? You, you yeah, did. well, I, I teach music lessons, so my hours are evening, so okay. I tend to keep a little bit of an odd schedule, yeah. At first, I thought you said you drank yourself out of bed well, for this. Well, <laughs> not, not today. I, I worked hard at being sober. <laughs> Just for the That's occasion. Right. <laughs> Thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> it's so kind. So <laughs> I do what I can. You do what you can. So you are the author of the uh, Blue Bells Chronicles, which is a historical uh, about Scotland, right? It's a trilogy. Yes. Time travel. Well, it's, Ooh, it's a trilogy. I didn't know it was time travel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's the whole fun of it. It's a trilogy in five books. What? Yeah, yeah. Let me show Wait you. Let me show you. That's inter There's, that's interesting. I'm not good at math, but that doesn't make well, sense. <laughs> refer back to Douglas Adams. What what did he the uh, I he had a name for it. I forgot. This is this is book one, and there's a funny story about this. It was actually meant to be a standalone book. It was meant to be the story of this obnoxious, arrogant musician uh -huh. who uh, just you know does whatever he pleases because he's rich and he's in control of everything. And then his girlfriend has enough and leaves him in a medieval tower. Their orchestra is in Scotland on tour, and he wakes up in the wrong century. So that was kind of meant to be the story. And at the end, he finally, you know, becomes a little less selfish and does a good deed and, you know, may no good deed go unpunished sort of thing. But then my sister read it, and she said, well, what happens next? And I kind of thought, well, he's dead, so probably nothing. <laughs> and um, I couldn't figure out why she missed that he was dead after what he did. And yeah. I went back and read it, and I realized I really never said that he was dead. I just said he kind of saw a bright light or whatever, whatever it was I said. And I thought, well, that is a really interesting question. What would happen next if he survived? And so I wrote part two of the trilogy, and in like part two, right, this, this really is part two because it's the story of his two years caught in medieval Scotland okay. and all the adventures he has there. Um, there is a man named Neil who comes up in the first book, and Neil actually switches times too and ends up in the modern day. He's a medieval Highland warrior. And he's everything that Sean isn't. He looks just like Sean, which, you know, we find what's probably a fairly obvious explanation for that later in the series. But he's completely different from Sean. He's noble and he's upright and he's devout, whereas Sean is a womanizer and a gambler and a drinker and, you know, just having the time of his life, but really kind of making <laughs> it for a lot of people. Really so, living it um, up. Yeah, and a lot of people are like, hey, he sounds like a great guy. Um, what's <laughs> You're saying this like it's a bad thing. Yeah, right. Um, so anyway, in these <laughs> two books, uh, this is the second and this is the third, but they were originally one book. It's the second arc of the story where he's caught in medieval Scotland, but right. he's, he's spending a lot of time with Neil. He's spending time in a world where, you know, people die if you mess up and sometimes some pretty horrible deaths. He's coming to understand a, a lot of things about life, about himself, about how he's behaved. And I like to think there's a lot of humor. It's, it's not preachy. Sean's actually, he's a very fun guy, yeah. if you don't have to put up with him personally. Um, <laughs> and so, let me see. Here is what was originally book three. Okay. Uh, so, book four... And book five, nope, wrong order. This is book four, and this is book five. Okay. And these are the third arc of the story in which he does make it home to his own time. 
And he's a very changed man, of course. And by now the question is, is he going to retain those changes or is he going to go right back to being who he was after this whole wild experience? And one of the things I've really had fun with is Sean was a master liar. He always had a story. And so after two years in medieval Scotland, he comes back and he's only been missing a year in our time. And so he has to keep concocting these stories for where he was for that year. And he keeps forgetting it's only a year for everyone else. And he keeps right. making up these different stories. And he just, he finally gets fed up with it and starts saying, I was in medieval Scotland. And the irony of my life is the one time I finally tell the truth is the one time nobody's ever going to believe me. And so those two books, uh, what was originally book three, the third arc of the story, they kind of conclude with, well, there's a lot going on. There is an evil medieval madman who's accidentally crossed times and there is a prophecy and a blessing relating to Sean's infant son. And so he ends up facing a lot of problems in the modern time now that he's back that he really didn't anticipate. And that comes to the conclusion of, of what happens at the end. But try not to give spoilers. Right, sure. So he, he goes back in time. So he's in what, like present day, would you say, before he goes back in time? or Yes, he is in the present day. And I don't yeah. specify a year. So as technology changes, it'll become obvious. But... Um, yeah, medieval times uh, in, in Scotland. So d did you do a lot of research into the culture yes. and society during that time? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, medieval times is really a stretch of about a thousand years. Um, I think, sorry, I've got something in my eye. I think that um, depending who you talk to, the dates might vary a little bit, but it's going to be roughly 500s to 1500s. Okay. Um, maybe a little bit less than that. So when I say medieval, I'm speaking about the very specific time in my case of about 1314 is when my book starts. And okay. I believe it ends in 1319. So it's only a stretch about four and a half to five years that my story covers. Uh -huh. And um, But then of course, I did a lot of research on the events leading up to that too. Did you pick that specific time frame for a reason, 1314 to 1319? Um, Did something crazy happen? Yes. Scotland yes. At that time? Amazing happened. Don't get me started. I hope you have time. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's an incredible time in Scottish history. And so first, let me back up to how I came to this time. In the book, Sean is a trombone player. And uh, I think a lot of trombone players will roll their eyes and go, oh, of course, they're the ones who get into trouble. <laughs> I, don't, and, I don't know any trombone players. Oh, yeah. you do now. You know me. Um, hey, there you go. <laughs> so anyway, um, he's a trombone player. And I was too. I played all through high school and college. I majored in music. I played semi-professionally. I played freelance for um, quite a few years until I was about 30. Um, and the trombone is the one that's like, boom, boom, that one, right? Yep, that's that's With the one. With the three keys? Or is it three uh, or five? Well, yeah, you can you can get a trombone with three keys. It still has the slide, but, but most people are going to play the actual slide instrument. Okay. So, um, and in fact, I've got I've got a few trombones laying around the house, and I have a medieval sack butt hanging around too, which which is a medieval form of trombone. Will you play it for us? I uh, no no I, I I will play I will play some sounds for you but there's there's a sad story behind that um I can't play anymore and that's a long sad sidetrack story um so no I'll I'll make some I'll play a little bit on it if you want to hear it but anyway when you play trombone at all seriously most people are going to try a piece called Bluebells of Scotland. And it's based on an old folk tune, but somebody named Arthur Pryor in the late 1800s took this piece and turned it into a theme and variations. And what that means is you start with a simple melody and then you get more and more elaborate and have more and more fun with it. And it was written to prove that the trombone, although it's this very unwieldy instrument, can really do an awful lot. It's It's got this incredible range of about four and a half, four, four and a half octaves, possibly more for a professional. Okay. 
Okay. And yeah. it can move incredibly fast with somebody who really is skilled. So this is Sean's major showcase piece. You know, he struts across the stage playing this all the time and all the girls love it and, you know, scream his name. And, um, and so I figured, well, if this is his showcase piece, and I picked that because he's a trombone player, um, the book kind of has to be set in Scotland. And it, it also, the whole story sort of came from this childhood novel that I loved called In the Keep of Time. And I think I'm skipping ahead of myself. The lyrics of the original folk song include streaming banners and noble deeds. And okay. that's the kind of book I like to read. So yeah. that's the kind of book I wanted to write. And I figured that probably involves a war. So I started doing the research and I found out there are plenty of wars in any country's history. Yeah. But in Scotland, there are two major ones. There is Culloden, which was in the 1750s, I believe. And that was really their major tragedy. And, and for readers of Outlander, they'll know Culloden. That's, that's what the Outlander series sort of starts based around. On. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say based on, but that's a major, major event in that series by Diana Gabaldon. And yeah. The other major battle, that that was their most tragic loss. It just, it, it really destroyed them as a country in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But in 1314, there was the Battle of Bannockburn, and that is their major victory. Um, if I'm, I'm sure you know the movie Braveheart. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then there is the Outlaw King just came out. So Braveheart is the story of William Wallace, who really was the the foremost leader in this fight against the English when Edward I wanted to be overlord of Scotland. Mm. And he was executed in August of 1305, and it was horrible and awful, and I will not watch that scene with my eyes open. I, I watch it like this. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really, um, it was a very, very awful, brutal time. But so he died in 1305, and it was after that that Robert the Bruce really sort of picked up the, the banner, the gauntlet, so to speak, and took up this fight against the English. And so he spent, I think he, he was crowned in 1306, and there's a really interesting story behind how that happened. But he was crowned in 1306, and he basically, uh, his queen, his queen Elizabeth, said we are the king and queen of the may because he was crowned in this just rushed ceremony he had just killed a man in front of the altar at greyfriars kirk yeah. and uh, the the man he killed was john Coman, who was the major contender for the throne there is a whole story of how they made an agreement to stand together and then john Coman reneged Stab on that back. uh well john Coman stabbed Bruce in the back, figuratively. Bruce okay. stabbed him in the stomach, literally. Literally. And <laughs> the problem was, you know, yeah. killing, as Sean says in my books, is kind of a national hobby in medieval Scotland. So what's the big deal? And as is explained <laughs> to Sean by the people who live there, well, it becomes a big deal when you do it on sacred ground. You you can kill people, but you can't kill them in a church. So right. have I have some class, buddy. Right. No kidding. So, and the truth <laughs> is, Bruce did not technically kill him. He ran out and said to, I keep forgetting if it's Fitzgerald or Fitzpatrick, to some of his friends outside, I think I killed him. And whichever one it was, Fitzgerald, Fitzpatrick said, I'll make sure. And he ran in and he finished the job. And so <laughs> that clan today, their motto is Isikar, which means I'll make sure. And it's based on that moment when he made sure that John Coman was dead. So anyway, you get excommunicated for killing someone in front of an altar in a church. Right. And you can't be king once you're excommunicated. So there was this mad race to schoon, which we, we think the word is scone, but it's actually pronounced schoon. And that's where they're always crowned. And so he made this mad dash with a few of his followers. And he was crowned in this just really rushed ceremony with really no pomp, no circumstance for all. I know it was practically outdoors in the wilderness. I, it, it was probably in a church or something. But it was a very rushed affair before the Pope could find out and excommunicate him. And so they ended up just this band of foragers, uh, very few followers. He, They believe he spent that winter of 1306 to 1307 on the Isle of Arran, I 
think that they're not 100% sure, but many historians believe he did. Yeah. And then he came back in February 1307 with a vengeance, and he started taking back all the castles one by one that Edward I had taken from Scotland. Right. And right. so that brings us, skipping all the amazing stories within those years, that brings us up to 1314. Right. And it was Stirling Castle and I believe Roxburgh were the only castles left that England still held. So in those seven years, he really did a phenomenal job just taking back his country. Yeah. And exactly. yeah. Now, part of how he did this, you have to remember that Scotland of the time versus England of the time was a lot like our colonials against England. It was this little tiny country without much much to it you know they didn't have a great military force and they were standing against the world's greatest power so uh -huh. he did it with a lot of guerrilla warfare and he avoided face-to-face -face pitch battle at all costs now the problem was of his five brothers by this point it was only he and his younger brother edward left and edward was a hothead <laughs> and edward was told to go besiege sterling castle well, Edward got bored, and so Edward just, he had to provoke something, because that's the kind of guy he was. Uh -huh. And he said to the commander of Sterling, who was Philip Mowbray, who we see pop up over and over again in this whole series of stories, uh, he said, you've got a year to get Edward II, who is king by now, to come and defend you. Um, they made this agreement that Edward or Philip Mowbray would hand the castle over on Midsummer's Day, 1314, if Edward II did not finally come to help him out. And Bruce didn't really care for this. Robert the Bruce didn't because it forced him into pitched battle against an army that was going to be about five times bigger than his. So um, once again, this happened so long ago, and it was in a time I don't think they really cared about recording history as much as surviving. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we have the luxury of sitting here and taking notes and recording everything for posterity, and we think right. that the future is really going to care what happened. They really didn't. They were just trying to survive. So we don't know the actual numbers, but a lot of historians will say it was roughly maybe five to 8,000 Scots against maybe 20 to 24,000 English. Wow. And, and even that doesn't tell the whole story because the Scots were riding these little pony-like animals. They're actually extinct now, but they were called Garons, G-A-R-R-O-N-S. And they were like the Connemara pony. So they were small. Um, in fact, I have, I don't know if she'll come into the room and you can see her, but I have an Irish wolfhound. And if you look at a Connemara pony next to an Irish wolfhound, there is not a whole lot of difference in size. Really? Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. The Irish wolfhound is a very, very tall dog. And the Connemara pony is, you know, it's, it's a little bit taller, but it's really a very small animal. Wow. So here are the English on these massive war horses, you know, think the Percherons and just these big animals trained for battle. The Scots are on these little ponies. Uh, the English are much more likely to have, oh, let me, let me show you, to have something like this. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I, I keep things like medieval armor and swords in my house. Um, yeah, it's fun. Uh, the English are much more likely to have the chain mail, things like that, whereas a lot of the Scots were going to be wearing leather, leather armor. Um, so not only were the numbers vastly different, but how they were equipped was also <coughs> vastly different. So that, I think, is the story of how I ended up in Bannockburn in those years. And they ended up overcoming and, and taking the, the castle. I... Uh, Robert the Bruce sent Edward II running off the field, screaming like a little girl. <laughs> right. He completely routed them, and it's it's nice. an amazing story how he used Good. the land to his advantage and against the English and against the heavy horses. So it, it was knowing the land, and it was preparing the land. He was there, I think, about a month ahead of time. And he was preparing it with uh, these, what they called murder pits, which are kind of what you'd expect. They're these deep, deep holes in the ground. And there were spikes inside those holes. And so he dug these holes all across the field that the English would have to come across with their horses. And then he laid camouflage over the top. And so as the English charged yeah. down 
the horses. See you um, later, guys. That's amazing. Yeah, and, and then they have these things called caltropes, and they're kind of like these four-pointed things. They're they're a little bit like jacks in the game of jacks. Yeah. And no matter how you put them down, there's always going to be a point sticking up. So once again, if these are all over the field and the horses are coming across the field, you know, they step on it and there's another horse down. So, you know, and here again, one of the things that pops up throughout my story is Sean, the modern musician, and Neil, the medieval warrior, as they're talking about the differences between our time and theirs. And Sean's like, oh, the poor horses, that's awful. And Neil says, yeah, well, what do you think is going to happen to our women and children if we spare the poor little horses? Yeah, um, right. That's going to be really awful, too. And he says, you know, I, I care more about the women and the children than the horses. So tough luck. You know, welcome to the 14th yeah. century. It's it's not like this, and we do what we need to because you know our problem is not that our cell phone broke today. Our problem is that our wife and children are going to be raped and murdered. So I am so blessed to live in a time, <laughs> live what I do now. Yes. Like, holy crap. Yes. That was some. That was a medieval for sure. Like straight mm -hmm. up. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like being in hell. Uh. The. The more you study medieval history, the more grateful you will be. Um, every time I think I've got problems, you know, I, I think about the world that they lived in and really most of history. Um, you know, I, I have a scene in here. Like I said, the, the books, I really don't think they're preachy. I think there's a lot of humor in them. But there are some very serious moments where, for instance, Sean and Neil have to raise troops for further battles because, unfortunately, Bannockburn did not end the war between England. They, they wouldn't give up. Right. Um, and there is a scene where Sean and Neil have to raise troops and Sean finds himself with, you know, these 13 and 14 year old boys telling their mother, we need your boys. And, and he's like, you know, in my time, these boys are playing basketball. They're they're my trombone students. They're thinking about you know yeah. taking a girl to a dance, and these yeah. boys are going out to fight and die at that age. Yeah, it it does kind of make you think. It's also a, a miracle that like the human human uh, race survived all that it's, bloodshed and war. It's like yeah. how the heck did we get here? Yeah, <laughs> really bottlenecked and filtered filtered out a lot. <laughs> kidding. No kidding. It's unbelievable. So you've, you've published these five books. Mm -hmm. um, it is a five-book trilogy. Yep. I have one more. Okay. This this is the associated, what I call, not a cookbook. And Food and Feast. Food and Feast in the World of the Bluebells Chronicles, a gastronomic, historic, poetical, poetic, musical romp in time. And yeah. time, of course, is spelled T-H-Y-M-E. To, you know, right. funny. <laughs> so um, what it does is it goes through and it will give a scene from the book. Okay. And then, for instance, this one is a scene where Sean wakes up and he finds himself raiding with James Douglas when he was supposed to be on the other end of the country. Long story how that happened. And so then the next page will usually give a little bit of the history behind that scene. And then after that, I'll give some information maybe about the food or about a poem or legend and then i'll give some recipes of the food that they would have actually been eating wow. in that scene and and how they would have made it so the book has over 200 recipes and some of them are modern some of them are medieval some of them are things that warriors would have eaten as they were traveling in the wilderness some of them are things that you would find on the king's banquet table. So uh, there is a great recipe in there for how to make birds fly out of a pie. Just like, <laughs> That's just like in the yeah. rhyme, I, they actually I, did that. You, you have gone so much into detail with all these things and done so much legwork. How long did it take you from uh, idea to creation for this whole series? Uh, for the whole series, I started... November 3rd, 2005. I know that because it was NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month. Oh, wow. And I published the fifth book on March 23rd, uh, 2018. So 13 years from starting to finishing. So it's been a big part of my life. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can only imagine the amount of research it seems like you put in 
to it's, the books and then the, the you have to write it all out too like it's right not just, then, you can then, read the research but you have to actually transcribe it take it in turn mm -hmm. it into fiction <laughs> like, yeah that's amazing yeah. well you know and it's just it has been such a fun ride i have loved the research i have gone to scotland five times uh, one of those times was for a friend's memorial service, but the other four were all research trips. And so I would lay out an itinerary based on the scenes in the book for the most part, although there was there was room for just strictly fun too, going wherever. Yeah. And I would go visit each of those places. So it, there are some places that I probably wasn't able to get to, but for the most part, when you read this book, when you read about Sean in the very first book there at Eden Court Theater in Inverness, I actually did go there. I kind of knocked on their door, said, can you give me a tour? And yeah. there was this wonderful woman named Judith who worked there. And she's, she was so friendly. And she said, I would love to, but can you come back tomorrow? I can't today because Prince Andrew is having his tour today. <laughs> So uh, I miss Prince Andrew by that much. Oh, no. um, I, th I think we did <laughs> see him cool. arrive with his cars and his, you know, security guard or whatever. But I, w I was not allowed to have my tour with uh, Prince Andrew. Um, so I, I did go back the next day and she took me all over. She took me down into the bowels of the building. She took me to the backstage. She showed me the green rooms. So all the places that aren't normally open to the public and the places that I described the orchestra being, that's exactly what's really there. Wow. Um, you know, I've, I've climbed some of the mountains. I, I was not able to climb the exact mountain that Sean climbed, but I put on medieval boots and I climbed and I climbed and I climbed and I bet I know what, it hurt. <laughs> the, the next day I was in severe pain, um, you know, and, and that's what it's much footwear nowadays is much better, isn't it? Well, no, it, it was also that I'm not accustomed to climbing mountains for hours on end. And so that's part of why I did it, because, <laughs> you know, Sean doesn't climb mountains. And all of a sudden he is being forced on this cross country journey yeah. where he spends four or five days hiking up and down mountains. And that is that is like crazy commitment to your story. That's amazing. That's what makes it fun. I Yeah, like literally living the experience of yeah. the book. Yeah. You know, I think that's how we as authors make things as real as they can be and, and how we notice when there's a detail missing. Um, and this is part of what I do in my writer's group, too, that or even on NaNoWriMo on the reference forum. Are, are you familiar with the NaNoWriMo forums? Yeah, I've heard of it. I haven't I haven't actually been a part of it. OK, what, what's really neat about them is you can go in and you can ask a question and there is always an expert in something, anything that you need an expert in. And they'll say, well, you know, that's not going to work the way you're saying it is. So you need to do this, that and the other. Um, <laughs> here's a good example. Somebody was writing a book that involved a music teacher and she just casually said in her post, you know, something about how the music teacher is going to whack the piano student on the knuckles with a ruler. Well, mm -hmm. I teach piano and you can believe I was on top of that. You, you have not been allowed to treat a kid like that for the last 40 years, at least. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, and, and that's a small example, but that's part of why I do it is because if I'm actually there, I'm experiencing and seeing things that I just, I couldn't know otherwise. And besides, it's a tax deductible work trip. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What's well, not right, to like, yeah, right? Business. Yeah, what do they say? Um, if you want to have a good story, live a life worth writing about. Yeah, and right? there's a corollary to that, isn't there? There's a, a different half to that statement. It's I don't remember what it is. Uh, re write a. <laughs> I I don't know. There's a second I don't know. I have no clue. No clue. <laughs> yeah, and if you haven't lived an interesting life, I I don't know. There's something else to it. Get so. out there and do it, dummy. Yeah. <laughs> that's the quote yeah. <laughs> get out there and live it you dummy right. <laughs> no it's i it's really cool that you're doing that um and you've also you've also started your own publishing company yes correct yes. so and you have multiple authors and books available yes and um i'm, I'm thinking do i want to make a mad dash i yes I have, it, it actually started as sort of an in-house publishing company for my writer's group. 
And so there are maybe maybe 12 to 13 of the authors. Let me plug in my laptop here, get some power. There we go. Um, we have about 12 to 13 authors from my writers group who are published under this, but then we also expanded. And so I have a friend on the West Coast. She has written, I guess you'd call it, it's not quite a medical memoir, but it's a book for caregivers that was written after her son went through a, what is the name, a Ewing sarcoma, which is a, I, I believe it's mostly a childhood cancer, but he lived through that. And so she wrote this book to try and help caregivers, people who are the major caregivers for people in long-term illness. Mm -hmm. um, I have another friend, his name is Chris Powell, and his book is a medical memoir about his his wife's uh, extreme illness and death. Um, all kinds of happy books here. Um, there, there are some mysteries. It's life, books. right? <laughs> right, it really is. But we do have a wide variety. We have a lot of fiction, so we have um, so we have some mysteries. We have some romance, romantic adventure. We well, have let me ask you this: How yeah. did you how, how did you get into? So you published your own book through mm -hmm. uh, KDP. Um, or create yeah. space whenever when, right, right right but the publisher name on it is gabriel sorn but yes i use create gabriel space sorn. adp mm -hmm. okay um what what made you decide to go from just publishing your own book to starting the publishing company for yourself and then adding other um writers into it well it it really i'd say it started with uh one of our members his name is jack stanton and he is also an author and he joined our group in 2007 and he had already published a book about it was actually a reprint of a biography the jesuits wrote about his great uncle who was a missionary in belize so this was kind of um a crocodile dundee sort of guy who would hack his way through the jungle fighting alligators or whatever on his way to baptize a baby so it's nice. it's a really interesting <laughs> story and his family had the last extant copy of this book and he decided you know i should reprint it the technology is there and so he did he went down visited belize made extra notes uh, about the trip and so on and reprinted this book and so he had this background and when he joined our group he keep in mind that my writers group is a lot of people who are mostly significantly older than me um so jack and i and our friend judd were kind of the youngsters in the group in our 30s and 40s at the time uh -huh. and so they i don't think they really knew a lot about all the new technology coming out so jack was really pushing this and saying publishing is changing even if you get accepted by a traditional publisher they're expecting authors to do more and more and more of the marketing but they're yeah. still going to take the majority of the uh the royalties so why would you do anything but publish your own work you're still going to do all the marketing but now you get the majority of the royalties yeah. and yeah. that made sense at the time and particularly for me because i think my books are kind of hard to fit into. Um, they don't completely fit into secular fiction and they're definitely not Christian fiction, but they're books that try and take people as we really are and people as a whole think a lot about God. And yeah. in a lot of secular fiction, you just never see that. It's, it's like this whole world doesn't exist, even though for everybody in the world, it really does. So, right. You know, I didn't feel that my book was really going to fit well into either of these major worlds. So that was another reason that I went that direction. But we also talked about the fact that at the time, I, I think it's maybe changed in 13 years, but I think at the time there was still a bit of a stigma, possibly a lot of a stigma against indie publishing and self-publishing. Yeah. And so, we also had all these other people who were really very good writers and they'd been writing for years. They had these books ready to go. And we looked at the price of ISBNs. We looked at the issue of having create space listed as your publisher versus having a publisher name. And all these factors together, Jack and I created Gabriel's Horn and I bought, uh, when, when you buy a single ISBN, you probably know this, they can cost up to, something crazy like $125 for a single yeah. ISBN. 
but mm -hmm. the more you buy, the cheaper they get per ISBN. Buy them in bulk. Yeah, yeah. So, so I bought them in bulk because I knew we were going to use them, and we set up the company, we set up the website, and then life, life happens, things evolved. Um, my friend Chris got involved in this, and he started reaching out a little bit more to other people. He published his book with me, and I met somebody online. His name is Dan Blum, and we actually met on a poetry forum, and he's just, he's an incredible poet. And we started talking about writing, and he mentioned he had these two novels. Um, he's an interesting story. He whipped off this little satire in about two months and it got picked up by Viking for a six-figure advance. Um, wow. as, as far as I know, that was like the first book he wrote, first thing he submitted. And he thought, you know, I, I've made it as a writer. But there was a disagreement among the, uh, I guess, editors, publishers at Viking and one of the higher-ups hated his book and oh. buried it. So, you know, the lower one gave him this huge check, which was nice, but then nothing ever came of it because the other one buried the book. So they and, just left the book unpublished? Oh, no, it, it was published. It was okay. published. And I, I think the rights have reverted to him now because that was quite a few years ago. But so he thought, well, if I can get this silly little satire published that easily for that kind of an advance, here are these two phenomenal literary fiction books. Well, he shopped them around and shopped them around and all these agents got very excited and oh my gosh, this is wonderful, I can sell this. And for some reason, he could never, they, they could never get a publisher to actually pick up these books. Even And he's an incredible writer and these are wonderful books. So yeah. um, he, he did let me read the manuscript and my reaction was this book has to be out in the world and it just so happens I have a publishing company, so even though, you know, I'm on an anonymous poetry forum, being anonymous for a reason, you know, I don't want anyone to see my poetry. Right. Um, I said, <laughs> I, I love your book so much, I will break my anon anonymity, is that how you say it? Uh, for the sake of your anonymity, for the sake of your book. And yeah. um, and so his book is published under my uh, my company now. Um, Dan, uh, then you know other people have sent writers to me, and so I've published uh, one of my other authors is Sean Brink, who lives in Nebraska, and he has a series. I published a third of his series. I think his publisher closed or something like that. And so his trilogy is a Christian end times apocalyptic thriller type thing. Mm -hmm. And then he has another one that's an interesting story called My Gypsy War Diary, which is just this interesting tale about this boy who stumbles into this weird family history and this uh, fight with uh, this gypsy band who used to come through town and a hidden treasure. You know, it's kind of like a Goonies type story oh, in a cool. way. Um, yeah, Dan's book is called The Feet Say Run, and I just, I love it. It's about this 85-year-old man named Hans Jaeger, and every other chapter is him as an 85-year-old caught on this desert island after oh. this yacht that he and six others were on crashed in a storm. And, you know, it's like the last desert island that no GPS can find. <laughs> Um, right. And the chapters in between start with Hans as a 13-year-old in about 1939 Germany and wow. takes us through his life and what it was like to be in pre-war Germany as the Nazis were gaining power, how he had this Jewish girlfriend that he loved. She's actually Christian, but I think her father was Jewish. And so she, of course, is branded as that by the Nazis and how... He escapes out a window thinking that he's the one in danger and the Gestapo takes her instead because it's her they're really after. And it's it goes through how he ended up becoming a member of the Wehrmacht anyway yeah. and the various pressures that were on him. And I, I just, I'm wondering if publishers didn't pick it up because nobody wants to feel like they defended a Nazi, which I guess in a sense he was. But right. I think... I think that there is a powerful story to tell there that we cannot just sit and say there were a whole bunch of bad people because it's explaining how his mother was very pro-Hitler and his father was very, very anti-Hitler, yeah. and how there were all these pressures, how you're being exposed to propaganda constantly on the radio till you don't know which end is up. 
and how the radio is telling him, well, you know, our country is being attacked by Russia. So, you know, Hitler is beside the point. Our country is under attack. Right. And all the pressure that he's the only boy left in the village who hasn't signed up. And how he never did anything except drive a truck back and forth across Africa. And he never shot a gun except to kill a goose by accident, you know. And yeah. so it's, it's a humorous story. It's a sad story. It is... A really powerful look at history and how we should really understand history. Yes, we should condemn what perspective. Happened. Right? It's like get a get a whole new perspective on it. It's so did, it's yes, it's a great story. Do you do all? Do you do the editing and and that kind of thing for your? Okay, yes, wow. I do. You must be crazy busy. Um, <laughs> I take a lot of naps, yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's part of why it took me 13 years to write my own series. Yes, I, you edit I don't other people's know. works, you edit your own. Um, yes. And, and I still have kids at home. So, um, wow. when I, I don't know if you read my bio, but I have nine kids. And so, uh, when I started writing, they were all still at home. They were all still in school. Wow. And at this point, I only have two high schoolers and a middle schooler as far as kids left in school. So, um, you know, but I'm busy going to their activities and things like that, too. That's incredible. How do you find time to, to manage all that? I, when you write. When do you edit? When do you write? Do you have <laughs> time a day? Uh, when I can. Um, I used to have a really good schedule that I would get up in the morning, get them off to school, and I would write until about 2.30, 3 o'clock, and then I would go teach music lessons, and their dad would be home with them and make dinner, take care of all of that, and then I would come home, unfortunately, about the time they went to bed, and once they went to bed, then I would probably write for another hour or two. So I would sometimes be up until one o'clock in the morning and I'd usually be up again by six. So I, you know, I think in part, I tend not to need a whole lot of sleep and then all of a sudden I'll crash and I'll have two or three nights where I sleep 10 hours and then I'll be back to sleeping about five hours a night. So wow. yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how I do it. Fit it in where you can, right? Yeah. Yep. Let, if a student ask you, doesn't show up, for, I, in terms I, of in terms of for new writers out there, you've been doing this for a while. What kind of advice would you give people who are um, new to new to writing and l looking to self-publish their book? Um, the the first advice is get a writer's critique group, and I'm I'm very very lucky that excuse me I'm losing my voice. I I almost literally just walked into a great one. I was teaching music lessons, and there was a sign across from my studio. I was teaching at a community center. And it was the same place they met and their sign was hanging literally right across from my door. And they're a great group. You know, they're very, very into helping each other. They, I'd say we really, really care about each other. I've been with them for 13 years now, uh, 13, 14, something like that. And uh, I've, I've heard that some of them are not as good. I have heard that some groups, the people really want to make themselves look better by slamming everybody else's writing. So, you know, it, it may be that you need to look around a little bit and try a few groups to find one that you really like that fits you. Okay. But to have that feedback, and I, I would say, if at all possible, find one that meets every week. Um, okay. one, one of our older members, Judy, uh, the four oldest members of our group, and by oldest I mean the longest running, they've been together for 30 years, believe it wow. or not. And they have met almost every Wednesday for 30 years. You know, we'll, we'll take off That's a week. Incredible. Christmas. It, it's amazing. It's amazing. So um, we really care about each other. We care about each other's writing. Yeah. And Judy is always saying this is key that there are groups that meet once a month or every other week. And she said that it just doesn't work. You need the constant weekly yeah. feedback and, and the weekly meeting to to inspire. To refine, to refine your skills. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that's, that's the biggest thing is really get feedback. And then I think hopefully it's improving, but one of the problems with indie publishing, in a sense, it, it does get to be too easy and therefore people will put books out when they really are not ready to be put out when yeah. 
they should go through five or six more drafts. And so, you know, I'm kind of happy. One of the comments I got, I, I do go around to various book festivals, things like that, give talks. And so I was at the Fox Cities Book Festival. I've been there two years in a row, two or three, I think, two. And the librarian at Lawrence University, which happens to be my alma mater, uh, the first year I was there said, whoever did your editing did a great job. And I went, yes, right. no, that was me. <laughs> that, that was all me. Um, now, I did have an editor for two or three of the books in the middle, but the first one was entirely me, and so was the last one. And so, number one, it's very easy to miss details. And like I know, and I think it's in the first book, somebody, and it took two or three years before a reader caught it, and it had been through at least six or seven beta readers, including an English teacher, and everybody missed this mistake. Um, I used the homo homophone of heels instead of heels, so I wrote H-E-A-L-S instead of H-E-E-L-S. Ah. You know, there, there are like one or two mistakes, but we're talking at this point, the whole series, I don't know, is probably at least half a million words. The books are long. Um, yeah. And I'm glad to say people say they go fast. They're they're a quick read. They yeah. don't feel long, but that's a lot of words, and and there are mistakes. So, but you want to avoid as much as you can. You want to get the beta readers. You want to really take fe feedback seriously, and you you do have to balance it. Not everybody is going to like everything. You may have to sometimes say, well, I don't really agree with that feedback, and yet you do need to listen if people are saying, I don't think somebody would really behave that way. I don't think they would really speak that way. Um, what just happened isn't realistic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these things do happen in traditionally published work, too. I mean, I've seen some just horrible typos. I've seen an entire paragraph uh, it was a huge, huge author. It was a Danielle Steele book, and it's not a criticism of her. It's that even with that level of professional publishing, here's a paragraph, and a hundred years later, the same one or two paragraphs were repeated verbatim. And as a writer, I understand how that happens. You know, you're cutting and pasting, and you're saying, oh, that scene doesn't really belong there. It needed to happen earlier. Yeah. I understand how it happens. And that stuff can happen even with the traditional publishing and professional editors. But indie authors as a whole, we really, really need to watch that. And pay well, yeah, we're our, basically our own businesses. Yes, like, we are. We're our own publishing house. We have to, that's the face we put out there. The, mm -hmm. the product we put out there, that's what people are going to hang on to. Yeah. It's definitely something we have to be uh, more worrisome about, I suppose. Yeah, because because it's it's our name, and I think I think that as a whole we really are improving. Um, yeah. You know, I've I've read more and more indie fiction, and a lot of the indie fiction is making it onto the New York Times top 100. I'm told. Uh, I last I read it was something like a third of the titles on that list actually are indie published. So, wow. yeah, that's amazing, and it, and it, it does speak to the because getting the the amount of royalties you get plus the control and all that kind of stuff when like when you said the traditional publishers just aren't doing the marketing for you anymore so you kind of lose the whole value of having a name behind you right you know and we have to figure this all out on our own which yes. is which okay. it, which is you know it, it definitely i think it separates um, the people who really want to make a career out of writing from the people who just want to write a book. You know? Right, right. <clears throat> um, although I, I think there are people who are very happy to write a book and have it out there in print. Yeah. Um, it really depends what you want. I right. ideally would love to have the time to really focus on the writing. And, you know, it... it depends on being able to do the marketing in a way it's a catch-22 but it is absolutely it, it's fun i'm enjoying the ride absolutely you gotta keep keep on writing keep on going back to scotland laura it's, it's been uh, a pleasure getting to know you get to talk to you and hear about the bluebells chronicles um i do want to check these books out we can we can buy them on amazon correct uh yes e download and paperback Yes, they are ebooks. They're print. You can get them at Amazon. You can order them through any brick and mortar store. They won't be on the shelves, but any brick and mortar store can order them for you. Okay. Um, Barnes and Noble, Nook, 
Um, they should be available on iTunes. They should be available in pretty much any e-format. Okay, and then we can go to bluebellschronicles.com yep. um, to read more about it. And you you have a publishing website as well for the publishing yes, house? Yes, that is gabrielshornpress.com. So uh, all one word, of course, Gabriel's, plural, gabrielshornpress.com. Okay. Um, I do have my blog is bluebellstrilogy.blogspot.com. And that blog will dig into all things Scotland. Um, I'll have a lot of history there, things about modern day Scotland, Scottish recipes, um, interviews with other authors. Um, okay. my, my new website also just went up a few days oh, cool. ago. It's it's called booksandbrews.net. Books and, and Brews. Books and Brews. So uh, Michael Agnew is Minnesota's first beer Cicerone which is like a wine sommelier, but for beer. Gotcha. And so about two years ago, he and I started a program, and we've jumped around to various formats, but we're starting it as a podcast now where we interview an author for an hour, and Michael pairs beers to match the author's work. Oh, so, wow. And That's then we cool. sample it. It's, it's a lot of fun. We have a blast, and the authors do too. And we've had a few who, who don't want to take part in sampling the beer, and that's fine, but I think they still really have fun seeing what he comes up with. Yeah, and that's neat. Thought process. So we we are starting up again as a podcast this month. So that's Booksandbrews.com. Dot net. Dot net. Booksandbrews.net. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there is a, there is a bar or something called Books and Brews in, I think, Indiana, and I think they have the dot com. So okay. they're totally different. They're an actual pub type wow. establishment. So and we're, I'll make sure I'll make sure to get all the links to everything in the video below so people can check out um, right. all the stuff for you. Yep. Yeah. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Easy to find. Okay. Awesome. Well, Laura, thanks again so much for your time. I really do appreciate you coming on the Uweb interview show. It's been a blast well, getting to talk thank to you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you soon, okay? Thank you. You too. All right. We'll see you Thank later. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you would, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification for the bell. You know what? We love you. Love you. Love you. You know what?